City Council meeting. I do call this meeting to order, and uh, let's uh, start with the Pledge of Allegiance. If we go, please rise, raise the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, I have Henry take roll for us. Uh, Mayor Smith. Here. Paul Hagan. Here. Alan Keelan. Here. Scott Prochatsky. Here. Dave Peterson. Here. Paul Mayo. Here. John Lockwood. Here. Jillian Peterson. Here. Eric Colson. Here. Eight present. Uh, two absent. Uh, you have a quorum. Okay. Uh, Henry, would you also read the clerk's statement for the open meeting law for us? This meeting and all other meetings of the Common Council are open to the public. Proper notice has been posted and given to the press in accordance with Wisconsin state statutes, so the citizens may be aware of the time, place, and agenda of this meeting. You have an agenda in front of you. That I know there were some handouts that got put on your desk, um, but uh, the agenda is, is basically unchanged. We have two items under the regular agenda so I would be looking for approval of that agenda so moved second a motion by Keelan second by Peterson that we approve the agenda as printed with the additional handouts any discussion all in favor signify by saying aye aye against <coughs> motion carried we have a uh, just a real quick, uh, I think it's a real quick item. Uh, we have license report number 1235. This is a special class B temporary application to sell fermented malt beverages and wine for the Wapaka Rotary Club's annual bank banquet, which actually occurs tomorrow night. So luckily we are having this uh, special meeting tonight. <laughs> Mayor, I move to approve. Second. A motion by Mayo, second by Lockwood, that we approve this license report number 1235. Discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Okay, so the, the big item that we're here for tonight is the renewal of our insurance, and we know that that uh, uh, is uh, from a July 1st to a June 30th, so we're coming up on July 1st, and that's why we decided to have the special meeting tonight. Um, Henry, you want to set it up for him? Yeah, um, as you know, we had a, about a half hour, 45 minute discussion on uh, this topic last week. Um, I don't know, uh, about every three years or so, we do go out to market on our insurances. Uh, this would be for all our insurance except our airport liability, and we have some air underground storage tanks uh, at the airport. Uh, our current uh, carrier is EMC, uh, and our uh, broker is Gallagher. And we identified eight firms that could bid, if you will, on our insurance. We sent them packets. Four of them came back. And then Tina and I, uh, based on... <clears throat> you know, the pricing and, 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 and judgments about coverages and stuff. Pick two firms, EMC and then the league's uh, mutual insurance uh, program. And we were very open. We shared the results of that first, uh, uh, first cycle. And then we went back to both of them and said, okay, sharpen your pencils. Give us uh, your best uh, premium uh, offers. Um, it's an opportunity for you to explain your company, maybe what makes you stand out over the other. And the information we got back on that second uh, go around is what you saw last week. And uh, we discussed it. Uh, there were some questions uh, raised that were very legitimate and uh, I was just not uh, in a position to answer and felt comfortable answering them. And I think after the discussion, you just felt, well, let's bring uh, the companies in and then just talk to them directly, and that's why we're here today. We've got representatives from both companies. So I did talk briefly to the representatives uh, beforehand, and I just asked them to just introduce themselves and then give us a little background on their business as long as they're here. 
and uh, you know if they have any initial comments fine and uh, then we'll open it up for questions uh, to the uh, uh, for council members to ask questions of the to do that um, do you guys want to sit or stand at the podium if you want to we are you guys are on TV here so we do have to use a microphone so if you want to use the podium, that's fine. If not, I have a portable microphone that we can. You want to just use the podium? For, okay. Let's start with uh, EMC then first. And you guys just go ahead and introduce yourselves and uh, and tell us what. Uh, just go ahead. Good evening. Uh, I'm Ron Seymour. I am area senior vice president with Arthur J. Gallagher. Uh, Michael Berg is. Uh, Part of the team uh, actually he's the leader of our team out of the uh, Appleton office he also is an area senior vice president um, I have put in front of you uh, just uh, a few brochures here that will talk about um, you know Gallagher and uh, and and what uh, what we are in this space as far as public entity is concerned the first uh, cover page is Outlays are uh, Wisconsin offices. Uh, Arthur J. Gallagher, we are the fourth largest broker in the world with over 16,000 employees. Uh, and we are headquartered out of Itasca, Illinois. And Michael and I are on the right side of the border. And, uh, and uh, Michael's out of the Appleton office and I am out of the Wausau office. I have been associated with the city of Wapaka uh, since 2010. Uh, and in 2009, uh, Arthur J. Gallagher bought the book of business that was handled by Wausau Insurance and the Wausau Signature Agency. And Gallagher, after Liberty Mutual retired the Wausau Insurance brand name, we purchased that book of business. Thus, we came, became your brokers. I came involved in 2010 and have been your broker uh, handling your property and casualty and workers' compensation coverages. Uh, uh, since that time. Um, if you turn the page, uh, a little bit about Gallagher and our, our size. We are the largest broker in the United States uh, handling public entity business, that being schools, cities, villages, counties. Uh, we have, uh, in our niche, we have over 200 uh, individuals that are specifically designated to handle public entity business. So what we bring to the table for our customers is a tremendous amount of experience and we collaborate together to meet the needs of our customers. Uh, and because we handle literally thousands of cities throughout the United States and uh, it's, uh, it is an asset to each customer we handle to have uh, you know uh, that level of expertise to meet the uh, risk management needs of our our customers um, you know we provide for our customers uh, supplemental type services other than what you get from your carrier your carrier typically will have claim people and loss control people and Gallagher provides a service where we have claim advocates where if there is a claim that requires special investigation or uh, evaluation, we bring in our claim experts to look at the situation and to work with the carrier to make sure that coverage is being applied uh, correctly and that uh, you know the service and care for uh, an injured worker is uh, meeting their protocol. Um, if you go to the third page, uh, it talks a little bit about two announcements that we as Gallagher, you know, have been uh, awarded. Um, this comes from uh, our clients. Uh, there was a survey done. Uh, we were picked as the number one uh, broker in client satisfaction amongst the five top brokers in, in the country. Uh, so that says a lot about what our customers think of us. Uh, I think it's safe to say that uh, we've had a good relationship with the city. Uh, I've been told that by Henry and Tina 
Uh, EMC is a carrier that you know we work with that we brought to the city back in 2011 and uh, replaced Liberty Mutual as the uh, carrier. Uh, and EMC has been on the uh, on the coverage since then. Um, the other um, recognition that we have as far as Gallagher is concerned is in 2012 and in 2013 we had been voted as one of the most ethical uh, companies uh, you know in the industry. Um, we are a publicly traded company so we work on the premise of full disclosure as far as what we make. We state that in our proposals um, either in the percentage of uh, of premium that is in the form of commissions or fees. For your particular program, uh, we are compensated by the carrier as a percentage of premium, and that percentage varies depending on the line of coverage. Uh, and uh, that is, you know, in our proposals. And, it, and that commission is embedded into the premium, so it's not something that, that you see in addition to what is uh, being charged by the carrier. The commissions are embedded in that and the carrier pays us. The last page I'd, I'd like to uh, spend a little bit of time uh, going over because I think it provides you with uh, some information on how you know city governments work and I know budgets are something that you guys deal with uh, certainly on an annual basis and our our position with our carriers is that, you know, we want to provide for our clients uh, the ability to uh, give them some type of uh, uh, assurance that, you know, they can have some trust in in their what they need to budget from one year to the next. And if you look at the the top box there, going back to uh, the first column uh, and. 2011 2012 we show you what the premiums that were quoted and paid during the course of the year we did not handle your property at that time that at that time the property was uh, with the local government property program we did take over the property in 2012 13 policy year and showed uh, a savings to the city by taking that over um, uh, the dividends that we paid out, or I should say EMC did, is that uh, in 2011 and 12 they they had a 25% a level flat dividend, meaning that if they declared a dividend, that is what you were going to get, and that is what you received, plus additional uh, dividend because your losses were uh, a lot better than what uh, the level dividend dictated so you were paid additional uh, percentage uh, above and beyond the 25 percent. Uh, in 2012-13 you know we continued with the 25 percent flat. Uh, we were able to negotiate that with uh, EMC and we typically start this negotiation 90 days in advance you know because you guys need numbers to uh, be prepared to uh, you know figure out what you're going to allocate as far as expenses are for your budget uh, as it pertains to insurance. Uh, in the current year uh, that you're in right now and will be uh, in ending, um, you know, the, uh, the dividend that was negotiated with uh, EMC was 25%. Now for this renewal, we were able to negotiate a little bit better dividend, that being uh, 26%, and then... Uh, um, you know, that certainly we anticipate will be declared. Uh, EMC has been in business over 100 years and has never not declared a dividend. So what we put in our proposals, we fully expect that the carrier is going to end up paying out, you know, once uh, the audit of your insurance is done and then they declare a dividend. So um, although dividends can't be guaranteed by law, um, you know, we are 99.9% .9 sure that uh, based on the financial uh, you know, stability of EMC that they will certainly declare a dividend and, uh, you know, and 
you will see the full 26 percent uh, applied to your uh, workers comp premium if you drop down and you look at the estimated annual premium that's right above the bolded numbers okay reason I'm putting that there is because you know we expect our carriers to uh, evaluate a customer and provide a fair price we do not want them to come in and typically in the industry buy the business okay uh, because that doesn't do us any good if they're going to come back the next year and inflate their prices to make up for what they feel they made a given away the year before so it's very important for every every market that we go to that they understand that it is in the best interest of them the client and us as the broker that we bring a fair price you know to the table uh, because I know the city believes in long-term relationships uh, like I said Gallagher has been handling your business since 2009 and before that was a signature agency uh, was handling it before then and uh, that relationship continued after Gallagher bought that book of business so if you look at the bold numbers you know the net premium after the dividend was paid out I think that demonstrates that you know we were able to provide you with some assurance that you know what we don't have any big peaks or any values or low values we're bringing a solid number to the uh, to the city that reflects what the market is doing okay we know the market how it's being priced probably better than anybody out in the industry because we have a large book of business and so when we go to a carrier you know we're giving them target pricing and perimeter or parameters as far as how they need to uh, uh, price the account if they cannot make that uh, that mark then you know we're not gonna probably bring them to the table because uh, you know we don't want them to waste the city's times by coming out and doing surveys and taking up a lot of time you know we're gonna take our best top two or three and uh, bring them as a recommendation to the city this year we were awarded just EMC to uh, uh, bring to the table as the incumbent carrier and the incumbent broker and we feel that uh, EMC has definitely stepped to the plate not only from a financial aspect but from a coverage aspect and uh, down below you know with the blue headings is each one of the coverages that EMC handles for the city and um, uh, I am going to allow Michael to uh, handle that portion briefly just going over I think you also have that in the spreadsheet that Tina gave you okay I don't know Henry does that spreadsheet show EMC's umbrella at eight million dollars it does it does okay good all right okay uh, so Michael why don't you handle the uh, you know the coverage aspect of this and we'll take questions after that thank you Ron. real quickly before we get into the, the specific coverages um, if we look at the estimated premium net of dividend really 2012 13 13 14 and 14 15 we're seeing a, a whole lot of consistency right uh, plus or minus three thousand dollars Ron made a comment that we know the marketplace very well and if we look at what's going on in the insurance marketplace generally over that same time period we we're seeing anywhere between rate increases of three percent to seven percent and that's variable by line of business right so here we're seeing that the the results that were achieved by the negotiations of, of Ron and the team at Gallagher uh, EMC Henry and his team and then the, the solid loss performance and safety commitment that the city has put forth has actually achieved results much better than what the marketplace would would seem to dictate right now so these are very very good uh, results uh, being achieved I know that that you'll have some questions for us in regards to the coverages specifically as, as we move forward so I'll try to keep this this relatively high level and, and talk about specifically some of the improvements that that um, and, and, and significant um, enhancements that we have negotiated onto the the EMC program um, so looking at the the workers compensation um, not a whole lot to talk about there in terms of, of coverage changes uh, the general liability uh, the coverage applies 
two li limits in two, two ways. One, in each occurrence limit of $2 million, okay? And then an aggregate limit of, of $2 million and a products and completed operations aggregate of $4 million. So in, in general terms, the, the per occurrence limit means exactly what it sounds like, the limit that's available for any one single occurrence. The aggregate that's available is the aggregate, the most um, limit that will be paid in any one policy year, regardless of the number of claims, okay? So two million per occurrence, four million on the aggregate on the completed operations, or two million for the general aggregate. The commercial auto has a combined single limit of two million dollars. Um, that policy is um, not subject to an aggregate limit, so $2 million combined single limit, and that may be a little bit different than what you might be accustomed to on your personal policy where there's a separate limit for bodily injury or property damage. Here it's just $2 million, whether it's property damage or bodily injury. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump past the umbrella, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. So th the next is the public official's liability. There's a $2 million limit per wrongful act and a $2 million annual aggregate limit. I'm going to jump past the property and focus more on the liability coverages right now. Um, past the crime as well and down to the police professional. Uh, so there's again a $2 million limit for each wrongful act and a $2 million limit for an annual aggregate. If we jump back up to the umbrella, the umbrella is there to do exactly what it sounds like. It sits above and around the other liability coverages. So the, the scheduled underlying coverages on the umbrella include the employer's liability portion of the workers' compensation policy, the general liability policy, the liability portion of your auto policy, your public official's liability, and your police professional liability. So your umbrella provides really two key important functions. Your umbrella limit is $8 million per occurrence and $8 million in the aggregate. And that's an increase from the prior year. Prior year, we were at $3 million. EMC in, our, in, in trying to continue the partnership with the city of Wapaka and Gallagher has increased that to $8 million to afford additional coverage. So the, the, the two key um, functions of the umbrella, one, it provides an additional $8 million of limit for any single occurrence. So rather than having a $2 million police professional limit, you have $10 million of coverage available for any police professional event, okay? The other important thing that it does is it provides drop-down coverage in the event that you exhaust the aggregate limit on one of those underlying policies. So you know, your history um, hasn't shown that you're going to have the significant claims to get to that aggregate level, and there's some uh, tort immunities and caps in the state of Wisconsin that do a, a nice job of protecting those aggregates as well. But in the event that you have a public you have claims under your public officials policy or your police professional policy, and that aggregate limit is exhausted, your umbrella drops down and pays future claims um, until that, that $8 million limit is exhausted. Okay, so it's really, when we look at it, uh, depending on the coverage part, the so general terms, $10 million worth of coverage available per any one occurrence or in the aggregate for your liability coverages. I do have one, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, when an employee uses his personal car for city business, is that covered under the commercial vehicle part of it or not? Sure, uh, the, the employee's personal auto automobile liability policy will respond primary and the city's policy will respond on an excess basis. Okay. So the city has that additional protection afforded. To bring up one point you know it's the city does a good job of keeping and maintaining a you know a Ron, we, use, we use the mic oh. quick we can hear you fine it's okay <laughs> all right uh the city does a very good job of maintaining a uh a, a driver's list that you know lists all those individuals who have authority to drive city vehicles and we also recommend that if we have individuals that use their personal vehicle, uh, that they should also have information on that. And that includes, you know, the, a copy of, or a certificate of insurance showing that they have um, automobile coverage. And then EMC also, on an annual basis, runs MVRs. 
uh, motor vehicle reports to make sure that the individuals that we have on the driver's list have valid driver's license and they're not suspended. Uh, I think that's a good risk management tool because the last thing we want to do is have uh, an individual uh, drive in a vehicle and, on company business or city business, gets in an accident, and uh, we find out that they don't have a valid driver's license. And if it involves bodily injury, uh, it's going to make for good headlines because the other party, uh, certainly if we're at fault, is probably going to seek an attorney and that information is going to come out. And then that attorney is also more than likely going to delve into, okay, what does the city have in place to make sure that their individuals that are operating these vehicles have valid driver's license? With the lack of that, uh, and not running MVRs and not keeping a list uh, intact, you put the city at great w risk of somebody driving a vehicle who doesn't have a valid driver's license. So from a risk management standpoint, I think the city's doing a very good job. We're assisting them in that, and we want to make sure that people that are driving a city vehicle that says the city of Wapak on it has a good driving record because that's our name you know, on that vehicle. Uh, and we want to make sure that uh, they're operating it uh, properly. I know that the, the intention here was for us to talk a little bit and then turn it over to these folks and then have questions. Is that still the route we want to go, or do we want to take questions now? And Anybody have any specific questions right now you want to ask? I, I have one. Sure. And, um, you, you spent a lot of time on uh, workers' comp dividend and that EMC has declared one every year for 100 years. Um, but you can't guarantee it. Uh, what would cause a dividend not to be declared? If EMC's financial position deteriorated to a point um, or there was some other situation in which their board of directors made the determination not to issue a, a dividend, um, they would choose not to do that. So in other words, they could just decide we don't want to do it. Correct. They could determine that. Again, in the 100-plus the years they have not done that, they have um, they extend a, a lot of faith to their policyholders that those dividends will be declared. Um, and, and there's no expectation based upon uh, EMC's current financial position, anything in the marketplace that would lead us to believe that they would not issue that dividend. Okay. Anybody else? Any specific question? Real quickly, to, just to, to follow up on the dividend to make sure this is clear. Well, we cannot guarantee the dividend payment. The, the structure of your dividend is that the dividend is payable regardless of your loss history, or it is specific to the city of Wapaka and not based upon your own loss history or the loss history of a larger group. If and what we fully expect to believe, the EMC declares a dividend, you will receive 26% of that audited premium back in the form of dividend check. Anybody else? I just have one question. Uh, under your fire damage limit uh, for any fire, it, it looks like uh, our current policy has a a three hundred thousand dollar limit, and and uh, our renewal is saying a hundred thousand dollars. Can you explain that to me? Yeah, good question. But let me first. Um, fire damage limit uh, is a, a little bit of a um, uh, potentially a misleading name. Your your property insurance policy is in place to protect the city's physical assets from fire or similar peril. The fire damage limit, and to back up that, the, the total insurable value under your property insurance policy is s nearly $76 million. The fire damage legal liability coverage part under the uh, general liability is a, um, uh, a coverage part that provides um, protection for um, situations where you might, uh, on a short-term basis, rent a facility from another party or somebody like, it's a situation similar to that. Um, so it, it, just to clarify that perspective, um, we'll have to check. The, I, I would assume that EMC would continue with a $300,000 limit, and, and perhaps it's a typographical error on our part, so, so we will check with that. 
Thank you. Do Thank you understand you. the legal liability limit? So if you're renting uh, a facility from somebody and there is a loss and it is deemed that you were negligent in causing that loss and the owner of the building comes back, you know, and presents a suit and wants to, you know, basically subrogate for their losses, that liability limit is there to protect you for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but if there's a loss to your property that's owned by the city, that's covered under the property policy. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. you guys, I probably have some questions later on for you. All right, let's uh, move on then to the individuals that are representing the uh, league uh, insurance. Oh, good evening. I'll speak on behalf of the league. Uh, my name is Dennis Tweedell. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for the League of Municipalities Program. Terry Christian and uh, uh, Dustin Frosty are here. They're agents with the Westland Insurance Agency. And um, boy, all, all I can tell you is you're, you're going to just hear a complete contrast with regard to uh, what the what the prior presentation. Not, nothing wrong, just you know, completely different. As an example, you're looking at 50% of the employees of our program. I have an administrative assistant, and uh, my job basically is to manage our service providers. Now, that said, I've been involved with the league's program going back to 1984, and I've been involved with the local government property insurance fund that used to insure you up until just um, several years ago. Uh, I set up basically the way it looks today, um, starting in 1980 through 1992 under contract with the state. At that time, lost the contract to uh, Aon Insurance of, of, of Green Bay, but still very familiar with it. So that program uh, is probably about 90% of what I had originally written, as is the insurance policy that we're proposing. I wrote the policy. Um, I've been doing this business, like I say, since 1984, the first 17 years, the league program of which you were insured in, was with uh, Wausau Insurance. That went well when Nationwide Insurance bought them. Wausau got in trouble and just about went out of business in 1987. They were purchased by uh, Nationwide Insurance. Uh, Liberty Mutual purchased them from Nationwide Insurance in 1998, I believe it was, and the relationship that we had, which was very, very good relationship. We had about 408 insureds with the program of the um, 590 cities and villages. It went downhill in about six months. Uh, it became very clear that Boston could have cared less about a program in Wisconsin. So the directors of the League Insurance Trust, of which you were um, participants, decided, well, we can uh, we'll do another carrier until we get our own insurance company formed and we formed a League of Municipalities program in 2002. We've been operating ever since. We are up to 380 insureds. We have the majority of the cities and villages in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, you have to be a member of the League of Municipalities to be a member in it. Uh, it's been a very successful program. Uh, the One of the main differences when you look at the program is we operate only in the state of Wisconsin. I operate using six agencies across the state. They are designed, um, the way I have it designed is they are assigned territories. So each of my agencies is very, very proficient in municipalities because for a person like Terry, that's the majority of the business that he does. Terry has what, somewhere in the neighborhood of 45, 50 different municipalities? Well, 73, I was thinking of a different one. Uh, very, very, um, proficient, again, in terms of what the coverages are, what, what the needs are. And when I saw the uh, spreadsheet on the coverages, um, there's a lot of numbers there. And uh, I'm familiar with numbers. Like I said, I'm really the, the main face of the program. And uh, the service providers that we use are United Heartland out of New Berlin, Wisconsin. United Heartland's a very, very large workers' compensation-only carrier. They do about $185 million to cover each um, a year in work comp only in the state. But I'm the work comp carrier. I contract with them to do all of the servicing, the issuing of the policies, the claims handling, and the uh, loss control. 
The reason we can do that is I knew the CEO of that company. They did not want to write cities and villages because there was no commitment to early return to work for the policemen and firemen. They as a company just wouldn't write them. That worked out great for me. I'd known about them from other uh, programs that I worked with. And uh, so we worked out an arrangement where on an administrative contract, we are only one of two companies that they service and do all the service work on work comp. They are by far the premier work comp carrier if you were insured in the state of Wisconsin when you look at their history over a three or a five year period. It works out for us because they're not in our territory. We obviously aren't gonna go after the type of business that they do, yet I get the benefit of a company that's $185 million in work comp only. We write 12 million of work comp in the state. With regard to liability claims, we use a company called Statewide Services. Now you've never heard of Statewide Services, but you have heard of Rural Mutual. Statewide Services is a subsidiary of Rural Mutual Rural Mutual is the largest writer number-wise of governmentals in the state of Wisconsin. They currently insure 865 towns. They are the endorsed carrier for the Wisconsin Towns Program, but they don't write cities or villages. I don't write towns. I knew the CEO, luckily, of that program. We worked out an arrangement with them, again, under administrative contract basis, to be able to do the claims. So I've got a carrier that's been in the municipal business for more than 30 years with 850 other insureds in the state doing my claim adjusting, not on the risk, but doing the claim adjusting for it. I've got six law firms across the state that represent our program. We get very good service out of them. It's been the same six organizations for the past 15 years because when we were with Wausau Insurance, we were using some of those same defense firms for our public official liability insurance. Very mature program, very, very up to speed with regard to what governmental business is. And what I said before, you're looking at a lot of numbers. Um, I truly don't think that's where you should focus at all. We've got plenty of coverage available in terms of our limits. We have a $6 million limit. There's no aggregates. We can argue about eight, 10, you know, whatever it is you need. The other limits, um, they're adequate. That, for the most part, that both of the programs have, you know, have, have proposed to you. But what isn't being talked about here, and I want to spend a little bit of time just because this is my business. I've seen a lot of what's happening with the competition. I know what our coverages are. I know it's in our 59-page policy that includes eight endorsements. For our liability coverage, that's the entire program, 59 pages. Your current liability program is 235 pages with 94 endorsements in five policies. We have one policy with 59. When I wrote the local government property fund policy, I had an eight page policy with three endorsements. Your current policy is about 115 for property. That just shows some of the difference in thinking in terms of who or how the league operates. And part of what this translates to is Every company that operates in the state of Wisconsin has to file a form with the Office of the Commissioner of Insurance. It's a uh, annual statement. It's on an accounting basis called um, uh, uh, insurance accounting as opposed to gap accounting, statutory accounting. And on page 18 or 19, I believe it is, I did give a copy of it to Henry, it shows what our expense ratios are for operating. Everybody has to follow the same rules to get down to the same number. A typical insurance company in the state of Wisconsin, property, casualty, work comp, is gonna be in about the 30 to 35% range in terms of expenses. The uh, filing as of December 31st, EMC was at about 33%, give or take a tenth. We are at 18. Last year we were at 17, sort of thing. It shows again a difference in the model that we have with regard to operations, with regard to the expense. We're, we're under the umbrella of the League of Municipalities. You've been members of that probably going back to when they were formed. I think it's 118, 200 years, 118 to 120 years ago. I take it very seriously. When you look at the directors in our program and some of the materials you have in that uh, pamphlet that you have, where you see our letterhead, when you take a look at the directors, 
We've got the executive director for the League of Municipalities, Jerry Duchesne, who just replaced Dan Thompson. Dan Thompson had been there for 25 years. We have three elected officials from across the state and three administrative officials. That's the board of directors that I, that I have to report to. And basically their charge to me is, Dennis, if we don't have at least the same or better coverages than anybody else, there's no need for us to be in, in the business. With that, I asked um, Henry for a copy of your current policies. And uh, Henry was good enough to send it down to me. I went over with it, him, over them with him. And this is a, um, this is a copy of your policies. And the little pink things on here were issues that I believe you have coverage-wise. That's what I was saying. I think the focus should be on coverage. It should not be on the numbers. We're both adequate with, re with regard to the amount of coverage you have. But it's what is that coverage over? So if you have $6 million, if you have $2 million, or whatever it is, what's, what are the exclusions? And let me tell you a couple things that I find in your policies that are not in our policies. First of all, your police are not covered for punitive damages, which I think is an absolute horrendous mistake. You will have defense for that, but if there's a payment or if there's an award for punitive damages, no coverage. It was either three or four years ago that the town of Beloit got hit with two different $500,000 punitive damages awards. They were insured by a company through an organization called Horton. AAIS, I don't even know what it stands for. They had punitive damage coverage that took care of it. We were involved in a um, claim, the largest police claim we've had uh, under this program in the um, city of Mon or the village of Monaco, where we put a um, biohazard hood on an individual that the policeman thought was a spit hood. And he died of suffocation in the back seat of the police car in 2004. Had that individual been a minority, we would have had on national TV probably riots like you wouldn't have imagined in Madison or in, in the Milwaukee area. We had punitive damages coverage. We had coverage for that claim. We were lucky to settle it for one and a half million dollars. You have um, under your crime policy, which I don't write, but again, I'm familiar with the needs and I make sure our agents do what they're supposed to on them. You have an exclusion on your crime policy. First of all, I want to commend you in, on having $250,000. We, we have a hard time many times getting insurance to get 100,000. 250 is great, I'd rather see you at 500, but I'm happy that you're there. Except, it excludes bonded employees and the treasurer. Now, if I ever found one of our agents writing it in that manner, I think I'd probably yank their license. Who's bonded? Henry's bonded. Your police chief is bonded. Um, I don't know who the acting treasurer is or treasurer sort of thing. Maybe that's you also sort of thing. Peterson. But again, in the, uh, when you do just municipal business, the way to write the policy is these positions have to be bonded. You have to have a bond. It can be for any amount. But once you have the bond, then you delete the exclusion for bonded positions so the employee dishonesty is excess of that. Right now, whatever the bond is, is that's on Henry and the chief, that's, that's the maximum coverage there is. And the policy doesn't have computer fraud and wire transfer fraud. It just has employee dishonesty. Again, it's a standard that in our program, if you had been with us and when you were with us, you would have, you would have had those coverages. The... Um, Specific exclusion for cyber liability. Exclusion. Normally I've seen EMC write a policy that has a cyber liability endorsement. And they charge about 600 or $650. See, I, I see them all the time. Yours is the first policy that I've seen that's had a specific exclusion for cyber liability events. Our policy, we cover it up to policy limits. I'm not afraid of cyber liability. I don't see it as a the same issue that nonprofits and for-profit corporations, but you have no coverage under your program. You have no coverages for anything that happens at your beach, at your fairs, or at festivals. You say, well, how can that be? Again, it's because of the way the EMC policy is written in the state of Wisconsin, and it's been this way forever. They just recently changed an endorsement from 14 excluded activities down to nine. 
but one of the nine is beaches, pools, or any swimming area, unless it's specifically listed in what they call the declaration page of hazards, and it isn't there. You also don't have coverage for any fairs, festivals, fireworks, anything of that sort, with the exception if the claim comes from the use of your land. I mean, th these are items that every community that we insure in the state has a fair or a festival. Luckily, most of them have water. We've got 13,000 lakes. You know, for the life of me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dream of writing that into the program, program that I wrote. Um, back wages and benefits. You have a $50,000 limit for the payment of back wages and benefits on your program. We again have policy limits of six million. When I look at my 10 largest claims that we've had, two of the 10 have been employment claims that they've been well into the six figures and well above the $600,000 figure, each of them. Again, we've got the coverage for that. You have $50,000. You'd have defense of the claim. That's, that's no issue there but there is a limit on the back wages. Um, I'm not gonna go on forever on these, but um, there's a couple others that I think are really pretty important sort of thing. <clears throat> Again, I'm pretty familiar with what's going on with property. We have a program for no-fault sewer backup. I know EMC does too, maybe you've chosen not to do it, and that's fine. 60% of our insureds don't take the no-fault insu insurance coverage. But on your regular property coverage, if we had a backup in this building, as an example, what you're looking at in the basement, if you get several feet of sludge in here from a sewer backup, you have a maximum of $100,000 of coverage in your program. And let me tell you, $100,000, I've paid more for that in basements of homes. Two other things on the umbrella policy that they're talking about. And again, part of this, I think, just becomes because of the five different policies and trying to coordinate them. The commercial umbrella policy that's used by EMC and then has an, an endorsement for a municipal use on it. The, um, there's an endorsement in it that excludes any activity for police and fire. There's an exclusion to that exclusion, which I don't believe is allowed in the state, but that's the way it's written for police activities for two of the three coverage parts. So the police are covered for bodily injury, they're covered for personal injury, that's libel, slander, defamation of character, and for advertising, but they are not covered for wrongful acts. And wrongful acts is where the real activity is with police. That is covered under your police policy here with the police policy limits. It is not covered under the umbrella policy. And then the uh, last thing that I wanted to uh, talk about, because just with the tornado activity and some of the other activity that we see that's been happening weather-wise lately across the Midwest, your policies have a 100% coinsurance requirement. Normally, there's what's called an agreed amount endorsement, meaning the company takes the values that you reported as meeting the coinsurance requirement that agreed value endorsement is not on your current policies. I went over these with Henry. I'll leave them with Henry, sort of thing. He can, he can see who or what's here. There's probably another 20 or 30 items in here. We're specialists in the municipal program for a reason. And this is the reason that the league started its program back in 1984, was to take care and make sure that the municipalities that put their trust with the league truly relied on people like myself, people like Terry, to take care of what their needs are, to not have to be second guessing who or what coverages were that were needed. Of the 380 insureds that we've had in the past three years, I've only lost five. And most of those were small, most of those were to a local agent. You know, and that happens, you know, they, they come and go, but for the most part when they come, my retention is 99.2% over the past five years, sort of thing. When people come with us, they just seem to stay. We've got excellent claim service. I have excellent loss control service. My loss control services are different 
than a lot of other people, and again, the league's different. I'm not going to come here and tell you how to maintain your, pro, your playgrounds. I'm not going to be here to come and tell you how to fix your sidewalks or how to run your sewer districts. You know that. Your people know how to do that. I've got materials available. If you need somebody, yes, I could bring somebody out, but I'm not going to have people out on the ground taking up your employees' time. I do have loss control staff coming for, work, for workers' compensation. But our method in workers' compensation is to train management. It's not to train employees. We will, if required, but for the most part, our training is for the management. It's for the first-line supervisors. Because employees have learned long ago that when big crowds are together and the, somebody's up there trying to uh, teach some safety items, who is it that gets up and leaves the room to go check their Blackberries or their emails? It's the supervisors. Well, what do you think, what kind of message do you think that sends to the employees? Sort of thing. Our methods work. Our workers' compensation experience mods, I think, are stellar. We've got a number of insureds, your size, obviously. We have quite a few that are larger. And out of 380, we obviously have a number of them that are smaller. I would uh, welcome any questions that you have. I know I've thrown a lot at you, but like I say, when, um, when I saw so much of the discussion, I was hearing that the discussion was going on amounts of coverage, even premium. I think I thought it was important enough to bring up some of the coverage differences between the league and the other program that you have currently in place. Obviously don't know what was in their new proposal. I don't know if it would be any different than what you had. It didn't seem to indicate other than the increase in the um, umbrella limit. And I think the umbrella limit they had before was probably adequate. It's the underlying coverages in the policy, not the amounts that you have to be concerned about. So how's that for a quick insurance education? <laughs> Anybody have any questions of Dennis? Yes. Paul, go ahead. Um, there are several spots here. I know you said not to pay, pay attention to numbers. Yep. Yeah, I'm go paying, ahead. I'm paying attention to them. Um, concerning aggregates. Uh, under general liability, we have a general aggregate limit and a products completed operations aggregate. Yes. Um, under public officials liability, we have annual aggregate and under <coughs> um, police, we have another annual aggregate. Right. Un under your current policies. That's well, correct. I, I'm, well, I'm, I'm looking at your column here. Uh, under those headings and in those three sections, there's no number here. That does that mean that there is no aggregate? I, there's I, there's no aggregate. That's correct. So, so if you had if you had limit. three five or if you had we have we quoted a six million dollar limit, I believe, didn't we? I, I'm looking at five here. Okay, five. Uh, if we had three different oh, events that were five million, you'd have the five million for each of them. If you had a hundred five million dollar events, you'd have five times that. I have reinsurance behind what I do, okay. so that's that's how I can do that. Um, my second question concerns the uh, the dividend, the workers' comp dividend. Mm -hmm. Is it true that your dividend is, it just says average last five years, 10%. Is that 10% based on the workers' comp premium or the entire premium? That's the entire, well, that's the entire liability premium. So it's work comp and the liability portions, not okay. the property. Okay, good. That's all I have. Yeah, thank you. Paul. Okay. Um, Paul to Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Could you speak to the reasoning why um, for uninsured motorists and underinsured motorists you have 25,000 and 50,000? Yep. Oh, God, I, I love this one. 300 yeah. and 300 right. for the, what the current policy is. Yep. Okay, first of all, the theory behind uninsured, underinsured motorist coverage is if you're hit by, a, by underinsured or underinsured motorist coverage, your liability policy on your policy does nothing. So the uninsured portion allows you to stand in place or stand in place of what a party suing a carrier that had to respond. Okay. The city should have city employees driving the vehicles. City employees are covered by workers' compensation, which covers 100% of the medicals. It covers two-thirds of their wages tax-free. If that isn't adequate, then there's the $10,000 medical payment, there's the $25,000 un, um, uninsured, underinsured. 
if that isn't adequate, and this is the reason that we don't go higher, employees' personal vehicle and what they purchase on their personal vehicle, that uninsured and underinsured motorist coverage would then be next in line. And if an individual isn't carrying it on his own vehicle in amounts he feels adequate or she feels adequate, then why would the city want to be spending, I think it's approximately $3,000, to provide a coverage that the individuals should have already purchased on their own vehicle. It'd be equivalent to buying liability coverage for the individual's vehicle. Now, per, on a personal basis, for those of you just on your own car, your own home or whatever, my recommendation has always been, let's say you've got half a million dollars of coverage for your personal auto. You want that as a minimum in uninsured, underinsured motorist coverage, and assuming you have an umbrella. And if you don't have an umbrella, I'd go out tomorrow morning and purchase at least a $2 million personal umbrella, but get at least a million of that for uninsured, underinsured motorist coverage. I've gone so far because um, I uh, have grandchildren now, luckily, that I ferry around every now and then. I've purchased uninsured, underinsured motorist coverage on our boat because it's available on a boat. I could get hit just as easily on a lake as I could in the, on the thing, but it, it's a very important coverage, but it's a personal coverage. It's not a coverage that be, should, should be provided through the business. And if a, um, let's say that uh, Henry's going down to a conference in Madison and his wife is going along, get hit by an uninsured motorist. Same thing is going to be uh, available. I shouldn't say the same thing. She would not have workers' compensation available to her. She would have the med pay, the 25000 of uninsured motorist coverage, Henry's coverage, and she would have the right to sue Henry and the city. So that's where her coverage comes from because the liability side is there. If Henry wasn't negligent, they would then go to their own policy. trying to understand what you said to begin with you said so let's say for example the chief is hit by an uninsured motorist in a city vehicle so the policy covers him for and it's an uninsured yep okay so that would be uninsured would be twenty five thousand dollars plus the workers comp for any injury that the chief had <coughs> And then okay. his then his personal policy, whatever limits he had. Do our employees city city employee or city vehicles we're talking about, right? Yeah, I'm talking about city vehicles. Right, yeah. Exactly. But that would be personal vehicles too then. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. Your personal vehicle, the uninsured on your personal vehicle applies regardless of the vehicle that you're in. I don't I bet you nobody knows. You know, and um, and the, the the question came up, you know, which the, the the answer is exactly what it should be with regard to employees using their own vehicles. You know, that's that's fine. Their coverage is primary. Um, my recommendations are a little bit different, just for uh, probably ease of administering. I don't believe there's a need to um, check insurance that people have individually, but the, in terms of the licenses being checked, yes, that's a definite plus. You know, the company I used to work for required, <clears throat> when we used our own personal vehicles, to have business coverage for our vehicle. And um, and then they specified certain minimum limits as well. Now, apparently, we don't do that. So you do that. Well, they, they, there really is no such thing in Wisconsin as business coverage on a personal vehicle. What would happen there is, if you went to your carrier saying, I need a certificate of insurance for the city of Wapaka, sort of thing, because I'm using it for business reasons, if you hadn't declared that when you did your personal application, your premium's going to go up. So and I think that's another one of the reasons that I don't recommend that you ask people to get a certificate of insurance. Well, I've, I've been retired 10 years, so things have changed perhaps since yeah. then. But um, yeah, we had to show proof of yep. insurance, business coverage, or... I, see, I, I don't know how you could get business coverage on a personal vehicle because there's automatic provisions in a policy that take care of that. But that, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Any other 
question specifically for Dennis. Everybody? Thanks, Dennis. Thank you. Appreciate Rod, it. Mike, do you guys want to uh, respond at all, or does anybody else have any questions of Ron or Mike now that we've heard Dennis's side? We've heard both sides here. Um. As far as uh, some of the things that uh, he pointed out, uh, they are correct as far as the coverage is within the policy. Um, as far as special events and that stuff are concerned, we do write uh, separate policies for that as they come up. And that's how EMC handles that coverage and Gallagher handles it for their, their customers. Um, as far as the uninsured motorist is concerned, you know, that can be something we could debate all night long as far as whether or not 300,000 or 25 or 10 is the correct number. Um, uh, you know, I believe it's important to protect, uh, you know, both the uh, city employees, uh, you know, and uh, vehicles that they operate from, you know, unfortunate events of, uh, you know, somebody getting involved in an accident where the other party does not have enough insurance or no insurance at all. So that's why the limits are what they are. Um, other than that, um, you know, we are, I think the major difference is and you know, coverage is important. Nobody's debating that, that, it's, it, that it shouldn't be uh, from a cost aspect. Um, you know, the, uh, the way dividends are calculated by the carrier is much different than the league. Uh, they're using a 10% average, but there's no guarantee that that's going to be paid out. 2011, I believe, they did not pay out a dividend at all. At least that's what was indicated in their uh, specifications. Um, so, from a budgetary aspect, you know, I ask that you, you look at the uh, what uh, EMC is offering uh, because it's uh, it's 99.9% .9 sure that it's going to be paid out based on their past history. Uh, where with the league, um, uh, you know, it's not only the experience of them, or you, the city of Wapaka, but it's the experience of of all the members uh, as far as what dividend is going to be declared, if any at all. So uh, with that, uh, I'll take any other questions. Ron, can you answer the question that Dennis stated about uh, beaches? I mean, because we do have a city beach, and he talked about not be, our beach not being insured. Not sure I fully understood that, but under our current policy, is our beach covered? Yeah, you know, I'm going to have to uh, refer to the policy and uh, you know, and look at that specific language. Uh, I don't have the policy with me, um, and so uh, you know I can certainly get back to to Henry. Uh, but you know it is property owned by the uh, the city. If there's uh, a you know bodily injury or property damage, that is well be more bodily injury than any kind of property damage. That would be the exposure. Uh, I'll look to see how the policy uh, reacts to that, but I don't have the uh, I don't have the policy with me to uh, to look into it. Okay, and then as far as sorry, <laughs> I just you were talking about special events. Okay, mm -hmm. now most of our special events are are uh, done by other organizations, namely our Chamber of Commerce and so on. Mm -hmm. And so I guess we wouldn't be liable for that anyways, but what if they were not insured for that either? Well, that's part of your risk management philosophy that uh, anybody that is that the Chamber of Commerce or the city is hiring and outsourcing you know, like fireworks and that, that you uh, request from them a certificate of insurance. And our rule of thumb is, is the level of coverage that you're requesting should be uh, equal to what you as a city carry yourself. So, and uh, I'm not aware of the fact of 
the city being uh, you know, delinquent in asking for certificates of insurance. It's certainly something that we discuss with, uh, with you guys uh, to remind you that you know, anytime you have a third party uh, providing a service for the city, be it a contractor or a special event, that before they step on the premises, provide any type of uh, work or to conduct uh, you know, a special event, that they need to supply you with a certificate of insurance. So we just had an event, uh, sorry about bogging down here, but I just want to fully understand this. So we just had an event this last week and it was Strawberry Fest downtown. So it was on city property, the city grounds, but it was also on the city streets and so on. So, and that's put on by the chamber. So the chamber would be liable for that, but if somebody got injured on the city property, the city would be covered by your policy or not? Uh, well, in a suit, they're going to probably bring in the Chamber of Commerce and they're going to bring in the city. Right. That's typically how, uh, you know, an, att an attorney would, um, uh, you know, attack that. Um, you know, this is, property is owned by the, uh, the city. If in lieu of no other coverage and an individual is injured and it was proven that uh, the city was negligent in some aspect, you know, then uh, there would be coverage for that. But this isn't going to be something that they just, you know, don't do a thorough investigation and in what the individual is alleging, you know, took place. And uh, so, uh, yeah, if somebody gets injured on your property, just like a contractor, they come in and they provide you a certificate of insurance and that they have coverage, uh, and then they do not, and they get injured, well, uh, there's going to be coverage for that individual. The other thing is they're going to be considered an employee, you know, because of the fact that they're they're performing a service on behalf of the city, uh, and uh, we thought that they were uh, providing a certificate of insurance that had uh, legit coverage, but if it was determined they did not, um, and uh, EMC was, or any other carrier that was. Um, uh, handling the, say, the workers' compensation because the individual got injured, um, you know, they would become an employee. And uh, payroll would be uh, associated to that individual. Premium would be charged, but coverage would be offered. Would be, well, you'd become part of your employee. Can you, um, off the top of your head, um, list some of the exclusions of the umbrella policy? I know it's brought up that wrongful acts by police are specifically excluded. Um, uh, what are some other ones? I believe you said punitive, punitive damages no, is what you want. Wrong, wrongful acts on that. Uh, uh, I don't have the policy here. It would be something that I would have to, uh, to look into further and discuss with the MC. Okay. Uh, off the top of my head, I do not have, you know, you know. Do you know how many exclusions there are? On the policy? On the umbrella? Uh, no. Okay. Not the number of exclusions, no. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? I wish I could tell you guys you had uh, a week or two weeks to... Uh, <laughs> decide on this, but we need to decide tonight because the policy starts <clears throat> July 1st. So uh, we'd be looking for additional discussion or a motion on, on a carrier. I would like to move that uh, the city um, use the uh, League of Municipalities for their insurance coverage for 2015. At their uh, quoted premium. Second. Sorry. Okay, we have a motion by mail, second by Peterson, that we approve of the uh, insurance from the League of Wisconsin Municipal Mutual Insurance. Uh, and Westland is the uh, brokerage firm. 
Any discussion on that? Um, <clears throat> Mayor, could, if, assuming the 10% average for the dividend from the League of Municipalities, um, and by my math, it was the work, the premium for the workman's comp and the um, general liability. Is that so? 10% of that would be roughly $9,000. Is that well, they have they have it as $11,000. 11000 is what an approximation would yeah. be. Yeah. So I was just looking at what the, the price differential, estimated price differential, would be between the two. Well, we'd be looking at a hundred and with the if we were to receive it, you'd be looking at a hundred and approximately a hundred and forty-eight thousand for the leagues, and you'd be looking at a hundred and forty-five uh, rounded. So about uh, about uh, three thousand dollars <coughs> difference. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Tweedle. Yes. Uh, you had the opportunity to review our current policy. I don't know if EMC had the opportunity to review, review your policy, but is there anything in, in our current policy that is there that you don't offer? Uh, the only difference would be that I'm aware of is a sublimit on non-monetary claims. So, and let's say as an example, um, the library here somebody doesn't want a book in the library it's just against their religion or whatever they say it we don't need that in a public library and they bring a suit to get that out they aren't asking for money they're asking for you to do something okay we have a limit of fifty thousand dollars for defense and the employers mutual of Wausau policy or employers mutual of Des Moines has policy limits for that so they would have their two million dollars in the 11 12 year history of the league program we've had two claims that our fifty thousand dollars was inadequate the difference also remember is um we have no de we have no de they have a three thousand dollar deductible we i believe quoted a one thousand dollar deductible on that part terry or not yeah. oh not on that I only quoted the $1,000 deductible on employee benefits liability. So we would have no deductible on your public official claims versus the 3000 per claim that's on theirs. So the, the, the numbers are always tough to make, make them work. Thank you. <coughs> Anybody else? Any questions, discussion on this? Just do a voice vote here. Okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against. Motion carried. I'm sorry. I, I should have done a roll call vote because it is a contract. Money. So let's do this again. Here. All right. Let me. Uh, <laughs> sorry. About as proficient as Sandy. On it. <laughs> okay. Um, John Lockwood. Aye. Eric Olson. Aye. Uh, Paul Hagen. Aye. Uh, Dev, Steve Hackett's absent. Paul Mayo. Aye. Scott Prochatsky. Aye. Alan Keelan. Aye. And Julian Peterson. Aye. We have uh, seven ayes, uh, zero noes, and three absent. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody, for attending tonight. We appreciate it. Um, we need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion by Keelan, second by Hagen, that we adjourn till our next regular scheduled meeting, which is July 1st, 2014 at 6 p.m. and is always subject to call. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Against. Motion carried. The meeting yeah, is adjourned at 7.15 p.m. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you.